He's an award-winning short story writer and novelist, and he's here tonight to share some wonderful tips with you on how to write, get published, and love the writer's life. I'm so honored to introduce to you John McNamara here on Writer Talks. I'm Elizabeth Ann Atkins, and I interview the winners of our short story contest here at Two Sisters Writing and Publishing, and John McNamara wrote an amazing story called Alice that will be published in our 2020 anthology of international writers. I'm so honored to introduce to you the wonderful writer, John McNamara. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Getting uh, Alice chosen by two sisters was an honor, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a fun story. Do you want to start talking about that first? Because I know you like to write flash fiction and short fiction, and it's it's like delivers a powerful punch in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this story, Alice, was a bit of a fluke in that it is a flash fiction piece of about 350 words, but it is a single sentence. And uh, it's any of the other writers out there who are listening will, will understand uh, midnight monkey brain, where either you can't get to sleep or you've woken up with an idea that is just clawing at your brain and you need one of two things to happen. Either you will forget it and go back to sleep if it allows that, or you will get up and jot down something that will remind you in the morning the third option, which I didn't mention, was you get up right away and you write down the story. And that's what I had done with the story, Alice. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I had taken a hiatus between finishing the draft of one novel and beginning the rewrite editing version of it. Uh, and I woke up at about 2.33 o'clock in the morning with this sentence running through my head. Not the entire 350 word sentence it ended up being, but just a, about a character and if scientists were to build a woman who, that kind of kicked it off. And it, mentally I was running through exactly what kinds of things would follow that. And I glanced over at my wife who was asleep and I slid out from underneath the covers, closed the bedroom door, tiptoed down to my office, booted the computer and just started typing. And inside about half an hour, 45 minutes, I had the draft of the story and uh -huh. sufficiently tired that I could go back to bed. So the next- Wow, day, I love that. <laughs> and then I, then I had set it aside and then I picked it up the next day and began fine tuning it and probably worked on it for a while and cut it down from maybe 500 words to the 340 that it ended up being. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. How did you do that? Did you, I call it literary liposuction where you trim the flab. Is that what you did? Uh, I like that expression. I may steal that at some point. Sure. I call it literary surgery. Oh, we're, we're close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or as most writers would call it, rewriting and editing. Right, right, uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. Can I tell a funny story that a professor once told me about editing and, and uh, rewriting? Uh, it, it involved, uh, it's purported to be true, and it involves a freelance writer in New York who submitted a story to a magazine and uh, was called by the editor to come in. So the writer went in, sat down with the editor, and the editor held up the sheaf of papers that included the story and said, uh, interesting, is this the best you can do? And the writer said, well, I bet I could tighten it up a little bit. He took the manuscript home, worked on it, dropped it off, and the, and the editor said, well, come back in a week and we'll go over it. So he went back and he started working distractedly on some other projects finished it, went back for the appointment, the editor's sitting at his desk and he holds up the sheaf of papers again and says, is this the best you can do? So the writer grabs the uh, sheaf of papers, runs back to his apartment, furiously rewrites for a couple of days, drops it off, and the editor says, we'll come back in a week and we'll discuss it. Oh no. So he's totally distracted now for this week, can't work on other projects, goes for his appointment with the editor, sits down and is fairly defiant in his expression. And the editor holds it up again and says, is this the best you can do? And the writer said, yes, damn it, this is the best I can do. And the editor says, all right, great. Now I'll read it. Wow. And wow. the professor who told me that, that story has stuck with me for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, 
he was a journalism professor when I was in studying journalism in undergrad. And that lesson has just stuck with me that his definition of writing was basically rewriting. Mm-hmm. And that stuck with me, very mm-hmm. stuck in me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rewriting is so important because you realize, you know, getting that first draft done is so important, but then, you know, you go in and trim the flab and you do it inadvertently, but you're getting the idea down and that's what's so important. So, so would you like to read Alice? Oh, that would be a good time. Okay. This is Alice. If you were a mad scientist breeding a perfectly trashy model, the kind that would appear in glossy magazines on racks in a highway truck stop, whose hair had been bleached a shade of blonde that resembled brass polish, who wore eyeliner that tapered to teardrop points at the outer corners of her eyes, whose lips part pouted in insouciant pucker as though puffed with collagen, whose smile froze halfway between suggestive and terrified, whose ballooning breasts sported large nipples but sagged against her rib cage because she couldn't afford the boob job that would have made them perky and buoyant, who cherished the tattoo of an unidentifiable bird on the inside of her left ankle, but regretted the lower back tramp stamp that read, teach me to be bad above a heart impaled by a black dagger, who wore paste on acrylic nails with a fake diamond studded on the middle finger of her right hand, whose moods swung between giddy and sad because of the choices she has made and can't stop herself from reviewing, whose sister is a housewife with three children married to a boring man with an office job, who wears her clothes too tight because then both men and women pay attention to her for wholly different reasons, who only eats salads during the week for lunch and then binges on Sunday mornings after spending most Saturday nights clubbing in the city, who assures her girlfriends she really doesn't want a boyfriend, but cries some nights because she's lonely, who thinks her nose is too broad and her ears too large, who hesitates to engage in conversations for fear of being judged stupid, who lost her virginity at a high school party to a boy because she wanted to be popular but achieved the opposite, who has ignored people calling her trailer trash under their breath who wonders why no one understands her, then you'd like Alice. Mm. I love the last part of it because when I first started reading and I'm like, okay, is this going to be a criticism of this woman? And guess what? That's such a real person, like exponentially real uh, women who have all of those traits, or at least some of them. So it just really captured a real woman and issues and things. And I love the happy sort of ending. Well, thank you. I, I wanted to go beyond just creating a stereotype. I wanted there to be things about Alice that would be familiar enough that people would relate to them. Mm-hmm. But I also wanted them to view her with empathy. Yes, yes, absolutely. The phrase don't judge a book by its cover comes to mind. And unfortunately, it's so easy to do that. But we as writers are tasked with the goal of illuminating the interior and the motivations and the history. And so, John, can you please talk about the novels you've written? You've got nine or 10 and three unpublished, including a pandemic novel. The pandemic novel called Isky Park in Quarantine is the latest one. And I, I have seen a lot of writers talking about how they were stymied during their lockdown, during the quarantine, uh, during the pandemic. I, uh, I was wrapping up the extension of a novella into a novel um, called Hunter's War, which deals with a character who had been a Vietnamese linguist during the Vietnam War in the Air Force. It picks him up Uh, during his time in the Air Force and immediately after his discharge. I have been on Zoom sessions with uh, friends who, like me, had been Vietnamese linguists in the war. And they were, interestingly, they were trying to pick out who in the book they thought they were. Oh, wow. As a lot of writers will say, if if there's a danger in knowing a writer and reading that person's work because you (laughs) want to find yourself in their work. So... um, I was thinking, what would this character, Hunter, be doing now 
40 years after the novella took place. Wow. Well, he'd be in quarantine. And so I have him in quarantine talking on Zoom with a lot of his friends. Oh, wow. Uh, and I filled out the novel from the length of a novella to a novel. Uh -huh. And we had an interesting uh, book review Zoom session among my friends. There must have been about 15 of them. Uh, many of them could not get past, well, who was Hunter? Who was this character? Where am oh. I? Uh, but it was, a, it was an interesting exercise in taking people who were familiar with the environment I used for the character and inserting themselves into a fictional account of what might have happened to someone. Mm. After I finished that, I, getting back to my point about writers in quarantine, I mm -hmm. felt stymied. I had, I felt listless. I didn't feel motivated. I couldn't read until it came to me that writing about the pandemic might be the perfect thing to do during the quarantine. Mm -hmm. and I started a novel about a neighborhood that surrounds a, on a U-shaped street, a small green space, a parkway. There are nine houses, nine families. And I decided to create those characters and have them interact during quarantine. And once I came upon the uh, notion for the book, I would sit down every morning and I had a goal of writing either a thousand words or working for four hours, whichever came first. I never had a day where the four hours came first. I was motivated, inspired, whatever uh, description you want to use for that verb. And I wrote the book all the way through starting in March of 2020 as the time frame of the book through the election of Biden. That's oh, wow. the, I structured it so that each month would be a chapter. And within each month, there would be five subsections, each dealing with a different character's point of view. And right now it's sitting uh, with my first reader uh, who probably is watching my wife. Uh, I trust her judgment on my writing probably more than anybody else's at this point. Well, that's a blessing to have your your partner be your your reader. That's phenomenal. So, wow. So it's so fascinating because you have had a career as a dean of a law school and you had the same discipline to your writing structure and rhythm and schedule. Can you talk about that? Because many people who have a day job and want to write full time or part time, you know, will be inspired by how you did it. I worked at a law school, an independent law school in Chicago for almost 25 years. Uh, the writing bug has been with me since bef since high school and, and undergrad, and uh, I used VA benefits to get my undergraduate degree and still had a lot of eligibility left afterwards. So I, ex I exhausted that eligibility by taking creative writing and literature classes. Oh. And after I did that, I continued to write off and on, mostly short stories because the notion of completing a novel length work just absolutely frightened me oh. until I decided to do it. And that's the, what you're alluding to when I was working at the law school. I tried coming home after a nine, 10 hour day and writing, and it was just too exhausting. Writing was a large part of what I did at the law school as a, an assistant dean on communications. So I decided I needed to write before I went to work and started setting the alarm clock for five o'clock and writing from five to seven and then getting ready to go to work. And I managed to complete a novel draft and that's the one book I've written that I do not have for sale on Amazon because I've gone back and looked at it and I'm really not pleased with what I wrote. Oh, really? So, I mean, with each successive novel, I always think I've done a little better than the first one. And that was mm -hmm. the first. Mm -hmm. At some point when I'm exhausted for ideas on what the next book will be, I may go back and give that a major rewrite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating. But you got up really early to write before work. And I did that when I worked at the Detroit News and I was writing my first novel and I had a full-time job as a newspaper reporter, which again is very taxing on time and energy. And that was the only way I got my novel done. And then I later wrote a screenplay and I did the same thing at a different job. That Those morning hours are golden. So do you have any other writing tips for writers out there? Like for example, how do you organize your thoughts, your research content? Um, how do you, do you write on paper? You've said you talk, you typed on the computer to write Alice. What's your, what's your structure? How do you do that? I, I work in Microsoft Word. 
I have a very wide monitor and I keep a running file that I call general notes or random notes when I'm working on a long piece. Mm -hmm. And the bullet points of things that occur to me, because as every writer knows, very rarely do you feel the inspiration attacks you when you're sitting at the keyboard. It's when you're, you know, preparing dinner that all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I wish I had that. I wish I had put that in. Well, I keep uh, my cell phone has a wonderful app that's called Notes. And I just dictate into it notes that are random at any time. Uh -huh. And then each morning I email myself those notes and I copy them into this random note oh. word file. And I keep on one side of the, of the monitor, I keep the work that I'm working on, the file that has the, the current work. And on the other side is the random notes. So I can go back and forth between either side of the monitor and find out what I want to do. Um, and as wow. Far as, and I, I find that that works for me. I know mm -hmm. that there are some writers who create an absolute spreadsheet of characters and things that go on. Now, I also have a third file of characters and I, I write out their names, their relationships. And as I go through the work, if, if something important happens to them, I will insert that as well. So I don't have to go thumbing through a 300 page manuscript to, fi that to find out what were their eyes? What color were they? Were they blue? Oh. Uh, so to be to remain consistent because mm -hmm. I I am a consistency uh, gnome. I just can't stand the inconsistencies. Uh huh. The first thing I, I find it. when I'm rewriting and editing one of my own manuscripts is, wait a minute, John, you made that's not what you said in chapter one. Oh. Uh, so those inconsistencies are my little bugaboos and my pet. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, for me, it's it's a long monitor. I used to have two monitors, two smaller ones, and one file in, in each one. But I find that they have to be side by side so I can go back and forth. Wow, that's a great tip. I love that so much because ideas come all day and night, as you said. So you were very fortunate to get a writer in residence position in the beautiful town of Saugatuck, Michigan, on Lake Michigan. Can you talk about how you how you got that and what happened while you were there? The School of the Art Institute of Chicago offers um, a summer residency program at Oxbow in Saugatuck, Michigan. And I applied for a writer, an artist in residency and was awarded a, uh, a week long residency, um, must have been in either 90 or 91. And that's when I was writing that first novel that I'm going to uh, probably attack sometime later. But they, uh, they set you up as an artist in residence in a little cabin that has a desk, a ceiling fan, a bed. It's very rustic there. Uh, Little known fact, Kermit the Frog was invented at, at the Oxbow uh, uh, location in Saugatuck. And uh, so I took my laptop and sat there and began writing the first morning. And wow. that, that day I, I put in 16 hours of writing. It's the most. I've what? Ever in one in, day? In one day. And wow. That probably uh, is why I don't like that book right now. I don't think anyone <laughs> ever write 16 straight hours and count on getting fantastic quality. Uh, but it, it was a oh, okay. experience. It's a beautiful, idyllic, rustic spot. Uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago is world renowned and they have excellent programs. They had bells that they would ring three times a day to summon everyone for meals. And uh, the first two days I was there, the only time people saw me was when I would come down for food, sit in the corner, eat very fast and go back and work on my manuscript. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fun. How many people were there? Oh, they have uh, more than 100 people are in, uh, in attendance at the various classes that they have. They have a wonderful array of classes in the visual arts, painting and ceramics and pottery and metalwork mm -hmm. and sculpture. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they vary what offerings there are each summer. And it was fantastic. I, I stayed up one night till five in the morning watching a class firing some uh, Raku pots. Oh, with, wow. With... Fascinating. So you got to be with other artists. And I bet that gave you a whole new general knowledge base about different types of art. 
it, that's uh, fascinating. It's always inspiring to me to be around other creative people. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think that's why it's almost essential if you're going to call yourself a writer, you have to be uh, a, an extensive reader as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So John, what's the most challenging thing about writing for you? I used to say it was the discipline, but I've gotten to an age and a stage in my life where getting up, walking into my office and sitting down, booting the computer and just getting to it is not difficult anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there used to, I, as I said before, I had a fear for a long time of being capable of writing a novel length manuscript. Well, now 10 books later, uh, I think I've overcome that fear to a great degree. Um, I guess the remaining the same is probably a fear that I have now or saying the same thing over. Oh, um, I wrote a book called Failing Billy, which was mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it probably best fits into the genre of speculative fiction because I had the main character as a child at about the age of five realized that he could borrow other people's vision. He was in an apartment in his house in New York with his mother and his younger sister who was taking a nap in her crib began to cry. And he gazed at the wall behind which her room rested. And all of a sudden he could see the interior of her room from her crib. That was his point of view. And he saw her starting to climb over the railing and he alerted his mother and said, Mickey's going to climb out of her crib. You better go save her. So his mother ran in the room and stopped his sister from being injured. And that's when he discovered he had this ability. Wow. And as he ages, um, he has a lot of problems dealing with the ability, how he uses it. His sister becomes very jealous because she doesn't have the ability. And the tension between the two of them propels a lot of the narrative. Wow, that's fascinating. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Woo. Love that. Is that your favorite novel? The favorite one is the one that I just put to bed. Okay. Okay. So, um, Failing Billy was a good one. I enjoyed that. The one prior to the uh, quarantine one is about a man who decides to fake his death at 9-11 and begin a new life. Wow. It's called Renner's Reboot. It's one of the ones that I haven't published yet. And it's about a consultant who is supposed to have a meeting in one of the towers on the morning of 9-11. But because he would, had a major fight with his wife before he went to New York from his home in Houston, he went on a bender the night before and was late getting to his appointment. And instead of being in the tower when it was struck, he was about a block and a half away. Wow. And uh, he watches the towers go down. He crosses the Brooklyn Bridge and sits over on the side watching the, the absolute carnage and decides that he's not going to answer the phone when his wife calls and that he is instead going to choose this as a do-over of his life. <gasps> and so it tracks him for 15 years of being dead to his family as far as they know. <laughs> Whoa, that is fascinating. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to reading that one. <laughs> I think that's the next one I'm going to get published. Oh, good. Do you publish yourself? Do you have a publisher, an agent? How do you publish? I have neither a publisher nor an agent. I self-publish on Amazon through the Kindle platform. Oh, excellent. And, uh, excellent. I mean, not that I wouldn't love to have an agent and go through traditional publishing, mm -hmm. um, but... At my age, I'm not going to sit around waiting to, to see if I can get that done. I want to be sure that my writing gets out there, even if it's just to a limited audience. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I published the first one through Amazon. Mm -hmm. I, I have a novel uh, called Finbar Lovely at the Crossroads that I'm shopping around to agents. Mm -hmm. and it's basically the main character is uh, in the throes of dying. He is... Oddly enough, his ex-wife asks him to move into his old house so that he can have his hospice there. And as he goes through days muddled by 
injections of heroin, basically morphine, he starts remembering crossroads in his life and wonders what would have happened had I chosen the other path. So he plays these, these mental games and emotional games of, okay, what if I had instead of going into the service during Vietnam, fled to Canada? Mm. And what if that one time I thought I met the perfect woman, my wife, who I ended up hurting and divorcing, I had just walked away that day. So he, he has a, a raft of uh, decisions that he wants to re-examine. And it's a mental exercise of a dying man. Oh my gosh. Whoa. My joyful works. <laughs> wow. But as writers, we contemplate those questions and present the answers that we get to the world. So that's pretty powerful. Would you offer any advice to those who might want to publish on Amazon? It's a personal decision, obviously, uh, but I would not discourage anyone from doing it. The platform is very easy to, uh, negoti to uh, negotiate and walk through. Mm -hmm. They help you set up the, uh, the inside and the outside very easily. But as with even with traditional publishing, a lot of the marketing is left to you. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. just a reality of publishing, I think, these days. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. big budgets from houses for ordinary writers is just not there anymore. If you're not right. a black a blockbuster writer, you're not going to get much of a marketing budget. Right. And uh, so social media is very important, I think, if you're going to self-publish. Mm -hmm. But I would say yes, if you are, if you want to to pursue the traditional publishing route, I say go for it. But if you want to get your work out there immediately, then self-publish through Amazon. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing it, and some have been very successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So John, do you work independently or do you have a writer's group, a critique group? I, I don't have a group. And um, we were talking earlier about the writing tribe. Yes. And uh, I, I believe that writers in tribes is a great idea to offer support, feedback, but it's ironic because we are the most untribal people at times. Mm -hmm. Such a solitary pursuit yes. that sometimes it's antithetical to our natures to get together as a group and discuss work. Yes. Although I have very fond memories of fiction studios when I was studying creating, creative mm. writing. Um, although at the, at the time I was doing it, there were a lot, a lot of the young people were younger than me. And it seemed like it was, all right, who can I cut down today instead of being supportive? But I, but I think oh. if I entered a group, a more seasoned, mature group, it would be, very, not, it would be a very nice and, and supportive uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Because I think as you get a little more uh, gray in your hair, you, uh, you begin to understand the value of other people's work even if it isn't anything like yours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their feedback. And their feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that camaraderie to be able to talk about verbs. And, <laughs> <laughs> and not using adverbs. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever read Stephen King's book on writing? I haven't, but I've seen snippets from it. He talks about that. That's one of my pet peeves, like the L-Y words adverbs. He talks about those. And that's part of my literary liposuction thing where if you have like four words, like the light could be seen glowing in the room, just say the light glowed mm -hmm. in the room, not that whole could be seen passive. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, I think it's fun to go in and go and like tighten it up. And oh, I just love that so much. Yeah. So what writing tip would you like to leave our viewers with tonight? Don't hesitate to put down anything on the either physical or digital page. Uh, if you sit there and think you're blocked because you can't come up with the exact writing phrase that you want, don't, don't do that. Get it down. Get it down. You can always rewrite it later. And your advice about adverbs and passive voices is, is wonderful because if your draft has it, put it in. Later, you can go in and you can change it. Right. Uh, and I think your example was perfect because I think, I think it was Hemingway that said, first, strip out all the adverbs. 
and make those the verbs. Because usually if you're going passive tense or passive voice with an adverb, you're much better off using the verb version of the adverb to convey action. Yes. But don't believe that a muse is going to strike you and put excellence on the page every time you sit down at the keyboard. Hammer it out <laughs> and get your word count. And then before you start the next day, read what you wrote the day before. Make the changes you think are appropriate. I also think that's great for continuity because then you're in the frame of mind of what you were mm-hmm. writing the day before and it'll help mm-hmm. you jumpstart the next day's writing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Excellent advice. Excellent. But don't go too far back because if you do, you get lost in the, in it, but you do have to reimmerse and refresh. I love that advice. Thank you. Well, John McNamara, I wish you the absolute best with your writing. I can't wait for you to publish your three unpublished novels. <laughs> Thank you. And bring those into the world. And thank you for joining me here on Writer Talks. Your short short story, Alice, will be in the 2020 uh, number four anthology of short story writers that we published with international writers. So it's going to be really great. So thank you very much for submitting. Thank you for joining me here on Writer Talks. And I wish you and your family the best. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you all of you for joining us here on Writer Talks, where you got to meet the award-winning short story writer and novelist, John McNamara, coming to us live from suburban Chicago, where he has his three unpublished novels that we're all eagerly awaiting to read. (laughs) So please do like the video with a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel and please follow me on Twitter at Elizabeth Atkins and at to the number two sisters writing. Meanwhile, happy writing and happy reading. We'll see you next time.